Welcome to episode five of Innovators and Creators. I'm your host, Assistant Director Sean Fry, and today I'm out at Eagle Bend Alpacas and talking with Linda Salisbury. And we are, she's explained to me everything, which is a lot to take in. So it's going to be a fun, fun episode of, of the podcast. And so let's just start with what got you in to alpacas. It was my husband. Okay. So. <laughs> so what happened? Well, so our kids grew up, as children will do, mm-hmm. and they all went their way. And we were left with this 52-acre farm and he says well we need to do something to um you know for our retirement and so I realized that the villages were not for me (laughs) and um I said okay dear because I'm a good southern wife and so he started talking to Jerry Brown at the ag office and um he and Jerry had this conversation and Jerry says well you could board horses well we'd had horses when the kids were young we didn't want to do that he said, your farm doesn't have good enough fences for cows. I agreed. Right. Uh, and I wasn't at this discussion. I was home minding my own business. He said, um, you could raise a garden. Uh, no, I am <laughs> not doing that. Um, and so then um, he says, or you could look into alpacas. And Greg said, well, what's that? So um, he And Jerry didn't know either. So he said, well, look it up on the Internet. So Greg came home, and he did the research, and he started looking up alpacas. And we look in Kentucky, and lo and behold, there's alpaca farms in Kentucky. We didn't even know that. And so um, it was in June of 2005, so we've been at this quite a while. And so um, he made some appointments to go look at alpacas at alpaca farms just to get a And I'm a good wife, so um, I said, okay, dear, we'll go. And I knew that if we went to look at alpacas, that um, he would probably um, stop for dinner and I wouldn't have to cook. So we we did that, and I went. (laughs) You had your own motivation. I went willingly. Yeah. And so we went to this big farm in Versailles, and um, the lady that was there talked, and Greg hung on her every word about the alpacas, and and I was, you know, thinking mean thoughts that I wasn't voicing out loud. And so she um, was telling him all this stuff. And I was thinking, well, it's really hot today and I'm getting a little hungry. But I, you know, I was just on the fringes of the conversation. I heard her say one thing, and that was alpaca spit. But other than that, I was unimpressed with all the other conversations. Right. So we went to the barn and they go in the barn. And I said, I'll just stay in the car. And the car, the air conditioner was on. I had on my new white tennis shoes. I wasn't going to get dirty. So um, anyway, they were in the barn for a very long time, and I was getting a little impatient. So I got out of the car, and I stomped to the barn gate where they were inside with all these alpacas. And I I put my hands on the gate, and I rested my chin on the top rung, and I started giving him the look. And he wasn't looking back. And I was being ignored. And I looked harder and harder. And I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on around me. But this alpaca was over here on this side of me. And that alpaca was very interested in me for some reason. And so as I was giving him the look, this alpaca, had they have long necks, you'll see. And it swung its head round in front of me and put its face right in my face and I thought oh oh my gosh it's gonna spit right in my face (laughs) and I didn't know what to look I didn't know whether to run I held my breath I didn't know what to do and so it's got its face right here and it brought its face in and it put its nose right here and then it backed up and walked away and I said honey we need to get some of these and so we did. So is the alpaca that sold you on the alpacas? Oh, well, it did. It Good. cast a spell on me. So it, the rest is history. Now, then we became one of, we became, I think at one time, we were the largest farm in the state as far as numbers of alpacas owned. And we... Now, we, what, how many alpacas is that? We had that? 150 here. Okay. Okay, 150. Now, we don't now. We are backing our numbers down as much as we can because in, in 14 years you get older 
and mm -hmm. your your body doesn't work as good as it used to. And we want to kind of slow down a little bit, mm -hmm. but we still have seventy. Okay. So I mean, so we're at half, a little yeah. less than half, and um, so now um, instead of you know, we've done every aspect of the business. Um, we have shown alpacas, competed nationally, won championships. We breed for good quality fiber and good conformation. And we sold seed stock for a while to other startup farms. And so um, we've done that. So, um, you know, we've now we're, we're transitioning and we've changed our business model. So instead of seed stock, and trying to sell alpacas for um, large sums of money, we are raising a fiber herd so that I can shear them, and then I can take the the fiber and turn it into yarn for our our new adventure, which is Eagle Bend Yarn and Fiber Shop. So, when you say fiber, what do you mean? Fiber is the fleece or hair that okay. grows on their back, on their body. And so, then you take that. Mm -hmm. And you you shear it. You you were telling us, mm -hmm. and and then uh, after that process, then then what do you do? Well, I guess, what's the shearing process like? Well, we have a shear that comes from New Zealand. Oh, you bring someone in. Okay, we so bring someone in. He comes in every year, and he's been coming. Well, we've been doing this. It'll be fourteen years or fifteen years. I'm not sure. I don't do the math well. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, he's been coming in to the country, and he. He shears, um, he makes like a circuit, and he shears at a bunch of farms. How did you find him? Well, there is a, an, an organization called Alipac that actually trains shears and, okay. and goes around and shears alpacas on alpaca farms. So he was one of them, okay. and, and he came here, and so um, he, he comes every April, and so it usually takes us two days okay. to get all the animals shorn. We board alpacas, too, for people who want to be involved but don't have a farm. or you right. know, So they board their animals here, and then they come here and see their animals, make breeding decisions, um, help on so the So kind farm. of what you did with horses. I mean, that same yeah. kind of concept. You have yeah, the space it's the same and, concept. and you yeah. understand what you're doing and, and, right. and stuff like and that. And we sort of mentor them to teach them. Alpacas are, are not like other livestock. Okay. They're different. There's a big learning curve about how to take care of them properly um, and how to treat them if they become ill. There, there's just a lot that goes. Did you have to find a special vet or is that something that's. We were blessed that the um, vet in Walton. Okay. Dr. Simpson, okay. he had just graduated, I think, from uh, Auburn, and he had done some camelid training. Okay. And so he became our, our farm vet. So it worked out. You had someone who was knowledgeable and who, mm -hmm. could, who could help you out. So that, I mean, obviously that's a big thing. So yeah. he, he's still our vet. He okay. works with us. He knows what we know, and he knows what we don't know. And so, and I'm medical by education. I'm a, I'm a registered nurse by education. My husband is a physician assistant. So he knows what we know, and we make a good medical team, the three of us. Right. That makes so, sense. Um, so, Because knowing know. when to call is just as important. Yeah, exactly. As, as all the other details, not, not to waste his time. So, so, you, so there's an organization that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And and the agriculture department helped you too. I mean, there's it's kind of like a no, no, not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> they did. <laughs> they gave a name, and you went off in that direction. Yeah, and... they didn't even do that. Okay. Um, we have a, an alpaca association in Kentucky okay. called the Kentucky Alpaca Association. Creative, yes. K A A. And um, I served on the board of directors for four or five years. Was the president of the state association for one of those years. And um, I'm still a member. Okay. And and within that the realm of the organization, we all help each other. Mm -hmm. The farm that you buy from is supposed to mentor you. Okay. And teach you. And so if we sell alpacas to somebody, we take that job, that role very seriously in staying in touch with those people, helping them learn, uh, troubleshoot when there's a, an illness or a problem, um, and that sort of thing. So it's a community. It very much is a community. Okay. So growing up in Boone County, you know, I don't fly far from the nest. Right. But now, because of alpacas, we have friends all over the United States and actually in other countries as well that we communicate with frequently. Okay. You know, so. So, okay, so you, you have... Uh 
the man that shears, mm-hmm. and then at, so after that process, then then what happens? Well, then, um, and that's a big deal. Like April, that's a big oh, time that's around a big here. Deal. And it used to be kind of a community event because right. um, Adam Howard, he used to work for mm-hmm. the judge. Mm-hmm. He would come help. Um, Nancy Swartzel that owned the B&B, she would come help. Jackie Steele would come help. So we had people from all over the community right. that would say, I want to help, I want to help. And they would come, and we'd all have a job, and we would all do the work. And um, so it, it kind of got to be, you know, yeah. a, a community thing. And it was fun. And we, we got tired, and we got <laughs> spit on, and yeah. but it was all good. Right, right. And now um, we have a list, a group of volunteers, honestly, that come and help us. It takes about 22 of us. Wow. 22 to 25 people that that come huh. and, and join in, and everybody's got a job, and so we work hard. It's a well-oiled machine. So after the the shearing is done, so mm-hmm. after that uh, amount of work, a lot of work, then what happens with the with the fiber? Is that what it's called at that point? Then it's the fiber? fiber. It's okay. So, so um, we, we put every... Every animal that goes to the mat to get shorn, we take that fiber from that specific animal and put it in a bag and label it with their name. Then it all goes into my so-called fleece room, which is my garage, and I have it sorted and graded. Now, I went to, um, I took classes in sorting and grading fiber. It could be any fiber, Mm -hmm. a camel, a, a goat, a sheep, whatever. And um, it comes under SUNY Cobbleskill, which is State University of New York. Cobbleskill is their ag department. Mm -hmm. And those classes were offered at a site down here closer to me. And so I paid and took those classes and became um, um, educated in doing that. So that fiber has value according to its fineness of micron. And so uh, I learned to do that. I have a a really sweet friend that comes, and on the day of shearing, she grades mine for me because I'm too busy running around directing traffic. You've got a small village here. I mean, you got a lot going on. Yeah, yelling at my husband, that sort of thing, so that she does that for me. So all of my fibers graded, and I divide it by the grades, um, grades one through six. Mine, the the fiber I have now is grades one, two, and three, which is the best. Uh, okay, so of the course. so the lower the better. Yes. Okay, and and, and does so. that also dictate price? Then L mm-hmm. one is more expensive. Um, than six. We have sold um, fiber to um, textile mills uh, or textile buyers, not okay. mills, in yeah. New York City. Yeah. Um, one of the people that bought our fiber in 2016 sold that fiber to Ralph Lauren, and that fiber went into the making of the Olympic sweaters. So good old Eagle Bend has um, sweaters on the back of our Olympic people. That's amazing. I know. It's awesome. You must have been very proud. I was. But I don't know which hair of mine was in there. (laughs) Hey, that's all right. But But there were other many farms that contributed to that clip. Wow. Okay. So we do, you know, we get around. Yeah, you are. (laughs) Okay. So so you you have that and then, um, and so your fiber and then. You put it and grade it, and then where does the fiber go? Well, right now, a lot of it's in the garage, and it's sorted by the grade. And I just made a trip to Somerville, Ohio, on Monday, and I went up and delivered fiber to the mill. And um, Carrie and Robbie Davis are the proprietors of that mill. They also own alpacas, and they turn it into yarn. And then when it's made into yarn, I bring it back here, and I put a price on it and put it in the store, and people come and buy it. So how did you find them then? So you, I mean... I, I met him at an alpaca show. It, it takes a lot, is, is what I'm learning. You're, you know, you're really interconnected with a lot of different people involved in this process. Yeah. And so they were at a show. They were just getting ready to open their mill. Um, Carrie had worked as a loan officer at a bank, and Robbie worked for, I think... The pipe fitters. Okay. And they decided they wanted to be in business for themselves. They wanted to open this fiber mill. They studied really hard, did a lot of homework, bought the equipment, which wasn't cheap. Right. And they stepped out on faith and opened this fiber mill. Um, a year later, Robbie had to quit his job because they were so busy, they just couldn't keep up the work. How exciting, though. And they're very successful young people. I just am so proud of them. Yeah. And they do such a good job for me. 
And so, so then they have it, and they hand it back to you. Mm-hmm. So, and it's ready. And then now what happens to your... Well, I, I put a label on it. I price it. And then um, people come to the store. Now, that label, does that still have the name of the yeah. oh, packet came from? Okay, it so we've, we haven't lost that connection to the animal. We have it's, not. And so the, you know, the fiber is sold. And my now that we've opened the yarn store, mm-hmm. then knitters or crochet people come here and they buy yarn. Uh, we try to talk them into sitting a while and knitting with us and um, having a Coke or a cup mm-hmm. of coffee. And we tell stories. We solve all the world's problems. It's just a nice hangout here, a nice refreshing place to be. So you made that pivot from um, strictly selling alpacas Mm -hmm. to now you have them here and and you're able to board other people's alpacas. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to take the fiber, make yarn, Mm -hmm. and then now you're inviting people to be engaged to, to do more here. Right. And you said, and you just opened this part up. Uh, a year ago? A year ago in August, actually. Oh, okay. So so that part of the business is relatively new. What's really fun is I feel like the people that come here find a place to be. Right. Sometimes you just need a place. What is it they say you want to go where everybody knows your name? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. you know, so we feel that way when we go to Towsie. To yeah. eat dinner, but then people feel that way when they come here. So we never meet a stranger, and we welcome just about everybody except people's husbands. We <laughs> we have to draw the line, you know. We can't let the men come in. I mean, my husband says when we built on last year, he says, we need to put a TV down here. And I said, what do you mean, we? <laughs> <laughs> You're never coming in. This, this You're doesn't, not allowed to. This doesn't matter. So keeping <laughs> keeping the boys out of the club is... Yeah, is, this, is what, it's the she shack. The she this shack? This is, is the she shack for, we, for our, our women our women in this community or what it, wherever they come from, right. they're welcome to be here, so... What are some ways that that you've gone about developing that community then? So you're you're reaching out to like-minded people, mm-hmm. uh, both crochet and knitters, right? So. Fa- we have a big Facebook presence. Okay. And um, we have uh, Eagle Bend Alpaca Facebook page where we have um, 11,500 mm-hmm. likes. We have the, now we have the yarn and fiber page as well, Eagle Bend Yarn and Fiber. And so social media has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. But we work in the community too. We love Burlington. We love Mm -hmm. Boone County. Um, You know, I try really hard to support the efforts of our county officials. Like we, you know, we like Judge Moore a whole lot. Mm -hmm. We're always making him come down here and get his picture made with alpacas. And he's a good sport. He does it. Um, you know, and we work, we are members of the, well, I don't think we are this year, but the Boone County Historic, um, Historical, now I can't even think of the name of it, but mm-hmm. we're members of that. And um, we, we, you know, network with, with all of the small businesses in Burlington. We support all of our local people in a big way. We do farm tours. I need to talk about the farm tours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the first two years we did this, we, we needed to get the word out. And so we did free farm tours to have people come and learn about alpacas because people thought we had three heads or there was something bad wrong with us and right. what's an alpaca. So we did these free farm tours to educate the public. And then, then it kind of caught on and then we got kind of busy so we thought oh well we better charge because our time is valuable so we began to charge a a nominal fee to come and the audience that we attracted and what I wanted to attract was educational groups Mm -hmm. so cub scouts um, girl scout troops um, and then it, it, it got a little bit bigger we had um, kindergarten classes or first grade classes and then um then we had homeschoolers. Then we had the Sierra Club and the Red Hat Society. And soon people from um, retirement homes were coming. And, and it just ballooned. And we right. were doing these tours. And then um, every year we have Kentucky State University comes and brings a busload of 
their um, summer ag discovery program students, and we do an educational program for them. So when you're doing an educational program, mm-hmm. just very, very vague, because, you know, you just gave a pretty wide range of ages. <laughs> yeah. What, um, I guess, what are you trying to educate on? What are, you, what, are you, what are you trying to show them or tell them or engage with them on? Well, with the ag students, um, Dr. Hollis and I always talk ahead of time, and we prepare a program. Right. And because those young people are looking to go into veterinary medicine or to be farm owners, livestock right. people themselves, what I have them do is um, herd health. Okay. So they actually get their hands on the animal. They have to weigh it. They have to do a physical assessment of it. They have to record their findings. Yeah. So they are looking from sort of a veterinary. They're coming here to work that day then. They work. They're working. And then these are, and these are college students. These are Well, they're or high, all ages. high school okay. to early college. And these are the kids that figure this pretty early in life this is what they want this is their and thing th- and they're uh, this is what i really want to do i was right. a, i did teach high school I, i'm a nurse but i also taught high school a so you got that years. background so you i have the, the teaching desire the, yeah that in little me. bug yeah okay so um and then with the cub scouts and and the girl scouts they actually can earn a badge okay for visiting an alpaca farm so I try to gear that program toward what requirements the badge has. Right, right. So um, it may be just, now, what do they eat? Um, so what do you do um, if one gets sick? You know, just just yeah. specific little questions. What do, you, now, what do you enjoy most about the younger groups that come through? Oh, my gosh. The alpacas love little children. Okay. They tolerate us adult, tall people. But when there's a little toddler yeah. in, in the pasture, they want that. They want to come over. They sniff her, their head. I had a mom's group come a couple of years ago, and it was somebody's birthday, and one of the little toddlers had a little crown on. And, oh, it's the sweetest thing. They, um, the alpacas all came over. They sniffed her head. She hugged their neck. Oh, my gosh, it makes me want to cry. Right. It was the sweetest thing I've ever seen. I just had to stand back. and. So these alpacas know, know how to turn the charm on, apparently, when it matters. You know, they they, they, they sold you, and they, and they, they know how to play up to children. They can't a- really hurt anyone. They, they don't have upper teeth. They have a soft palate, so they can't really bite you. Right. Um, they don't have hooves, so if they kick you, it's like a thump. Yeah. And they do have toenails. You could get scratched if they're not trimmed properly. Right. Um, they, they're really the only um, protection they have is to spit and run. Okay. And so um, with that said, dogs are a problem. Okay. They are pre- the predators that are the most harmful to alpacas are people's dogs. Okay. And we've had dog attacks on the farm. And with that said, you know, we had a really bad dog attack before we got the alpacas. We had some pet goats. And somebody let their dogs run loose, and they ended up in my barn, jumped the stall door, and mutilated my animals. I took those people to court, and the judge just said, well, you know, your husband should have been a better shot. Because there's no law to protect against such. Mm-hmm. So I carry a gun. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, would probably shoot somebody's dog if it, yeah. if I thought it was, in, you know, going to harm my animals. Well, and I'm taking a little bit different direction on that, too. There's a, a huge economic. You were saying that some of these animals are... Very expensive. You were for like $40,000? We have a handful of our, our studs that we paid... Mm-hmm you know, thirty to forty thousand dollars a piece for. Yeah. So I mean we have to protect our investment. Right. I would probably never shoot somebody somebody's dog, but I might right. shoot up in the air. Yeah, instead. well exactly. You know, but yeah, yeah, you're like, like I'm not going out to hurt someone's <laughs> yeah, animal, no. but also, you know, you have a responsibility both but my mentally na- and financially to respond well, to those animals. We're blessed. Our neighbors, we all have dogs out here. And so if somebody's dog gets out, they'll call and say, Oh, my dog's out. Right. If you see my dog, don't shoot it. Let me Yeah, no. <laughs> let me come makes... get it. and we do that. Yeah. They would do it for me. If I have dogs, you know, they're mm-hmm. awesome. So we have an awesome neighborhood that works collaboratively together you know if my alpacas get out or somebody's cows get out i mean we we all help each other so so you've got i mean just this little bit we've talked you've got a lot going on in a very positive way so you are so how many like so you got tours coming through here Mm -hmm. and then and you know like we're talking about the, the selling and then 
so the the she shack and the she shack. <laughs> the she shack. So, um, I do you have like kind of a downtime out here, or is it just pretty much year round? You've got something going on, or is it just does it slow? Or I mean, when's the busy time? When's the the, the cadence? Or is there is I, it always busy time? It's always busy, and yeah. because in addition to all of that. We have to take care of animals. Okay. So animals else? have to be fed. They yeah. have to be checked for health, good health. There's barns. The barn has to be cleaned. Mm-hmm. Manure has to be, you know, moved mm-hmm. and spread to fields that need refurbishing. Uh, fences need to be repaired. Mowing needs to be done. Hay needs to be put up. My husband does a lot. Right. He is just really works constantly and in addition he has a real demanding job um at the same time so um i no longer work in the public sector i work here Mm -hmm. and manage everything but um the thing that has been the most problematic of late is we have cut back on farm tours we've had to Mm -hmm. we don't have time for you know just to take grandma and grandpa and the Right. Ba- baby out in the field. We don't have time for that anymore. So um, what we've done is, well, this summer with the heat as bad as it's been, yeah. um, we've we've had to just turn away. I bet we've turned away three dozen farm tours only because as hot as it is, the animals go in the barn. We have big barrel fans and they lay by the fans to stay cool, and we don't disturb them. Right. Other than to go in and fill water buckets and check on everybody, we leave them alone. Yeah. And we don't need to be traipsing through the barn bringing visitors to see mm-hmm. hot alpacas. So we've turned away most all of the farm tours this year. But um, we have the brown signs up in Burlington that say Eagle Bend Alpacas. Mm-hmm. And those signs are directional signs. They're not really advertising, although they do serve that purpose. Mm-hmm. And we have people that just show up. Right. And they just show up and pull onto the property, and um, they wander. They get out of the car, and they wander around. Well, this is my home. Right. And this is my yard, and this is my private space. And for insurance reasons, we can't let people wander mm-hmm. around right. our property unescorted and without our knowledge. And um, even though I have signs posted everywhere, it's amazing how many people don't read anymore. (laughs) And so it's been a real dilemma to um, intercept those people and say, sorry, we have it on our website, Mm -hmm. the how you book a tour. And like I said, we have it posted on our our Facebook page and, you know, no tours without an appointment. Mm -hmm. Now, if you call and you want to schedule an appointment, um, we make arrangements to do that. There is a fee. We do charge for that. Um, And and we are thrilled that people want to know what we're doing. That's exciting to us. But we have to do it in a time frame that allows you're, us. You're trying to balance. Yeah. You know, and, and it's hard. So you, you had to move a little bit and change a little bit. Mm-hmm. But yet you're trying to balance that. No, that makes And it's makes hard to run sense. the store and then do tours at the same time. Right. There's, you're you're walking away from one and. There's not enough of me. So, right. um, you know, so that's been the biggest challenge this particular summer. So so out on out on the acreage right now you have. Alpacas, any other animals? Oh, yes. Okay. I have sheep. I love my sheep. Um, We have um, a flock, a small flock of fine wooled sheep called registered Cormo. And Cormo is a, I only know one other person in the whole state of Kentucky that has Cormo sheep. Mm -hmm. And she's my mentor and my friend. Okay. And um, she's getting ready to retire. So I'm thinking I'm going to take some of her sheep and bring here. Yeah. And so um, those sheep, we also shear. They get shorn in March. and we You do not need a man from New Zealand to come in and take I the sheep? So. I don't. My, my sheep shear is, he is amazing. Say that five Does it times all by fast, himself. Yeah. I'm down in the floor gathering it. My husband. No one gets husband. spit on either? Sheep are a little no, more laid back? No, they are. They're, they're do you do, now, do you, the same, do you do the same stuff with the wool on that? Mm-hmm. Or, okay, so the same. It goes the, up to Somerville, too? It does, okay. and I it goes. I blend some of it with my alpaca, so you might have a blend of alpaca and wool. Do people? I mean, is that they love it? Let's say, is that something? something and then we something. do just plain. It's uh, they have the most beautiful fiber I've ever laid eyes on. So, how many mm. sheep do you have? 
I only have 23. Only 23. I only have 23. And there's a few of them that are Shetlands. Um, But um, this, in April, uh, one of our mamas had triplets. So this is a great story. She had triplets and sheep only have two teats. So there was only milk for two. And one of them had kind of a weak front leg from where she laid in the uterus and was kind of crowded. So she couldn't fight to get to the teat and get what she needed. So my two, two of the lambs weighed five pounds and one weighed seven pounds. And it was cold and rainy that day. And um, we're down in the barn, um, my husband and I taking care of them and trying to get them dry. And we realized that the one was just too weak to bring to take care of herself so we brought her to the house and we knew we were going to have a bottle baby so I had this little five pound lamb that I'm bottle feeding every couple of hours it has a diaper on because I have to live there yeah and you know so I have this little lamb well then I had to come to work so I brought her down here so I carry the lamb and we come down here and I had her in a little box and it was maybe two or three days, and she figured out how to jump out of that box. So she would wander around the yarn store in her little diaper and get her milk. And the girls, my customers that come here to... ate it up, didn't they? They loved it. They were amazing. They helped me change diaper, clean up dirty stuff, give bottles. Well, then, it, and then they named her, and they named her Pearl, P-U-R-L. So knit and Pearl. It's a, it's a stitch, so her name's Pearl. So then it got to be kind of a, a point of contention because um, then people would start texting me, it's my turn to hold Pearl. <laughs> um, I, I get dibs on Pearl today, and they would come and sit in the rocking chairs in, in did, the room, and Pearl, they would ro- lo- rock her all day long. They wouldn't even knit. Did Pearl get her fa- on Facebook? Did Pearl get a- Oh, Pearl was so famous on Facebook. Pearl is like the queen of the farm now. So, but Pearl is bonded and she stayed in the house about four weeks and she learned to jump on the couch and sit on my lap like the dogs do and watch TV. If the dogs ran to the door to greet Greg when he got home, Pearl ran to the door. Um, she, she. Does uh, Pearl know she's a sheep? <laughs> Thinks his dog? You're going to meet Pearl. Okay. You'll meet her. And, um, she still loves me. She still, le- she still wants me to hold her. She's just adorable. And so she's very famous. And I have a lady that comes here now that says, I want to see Pearl today. Well, I, I had to do herd health that day. I couldn't take her to the barn. Mm-hmm. But um, people are very adamant about seeing Pearl. It's a connection. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the connection. So, okay, so it's 23 sheep. Uh, 70 alpaca. So what else you got? Well, there's actually 85 because I bored 15. <sighs> okay. That's, so there's a now, few more. Now you've gone beyond my math abilities. <laughs> so, okay. So beyond, beyond like, that's like 5 billion or something uh, animals. Okay. What, what else do you have? Do you have sheep? you have alpaca? What, anything else? I have else? some chickens. Chickens. Are- and they make eggs, which is just wonderful. Well, yeah. And the just- rooster wakes us up in the morning. You got alarm clock. You got breakfast. You I got, do. I, you got endless okay. fiber. And then I have three Scotties. Oh. That make my life really crazy. <laughs> yeah, they. Those are the ones that put you over the edge. They do. <laughs> they do. I I use profanity sometimes when I'm chasing them away from the road, or you know, it's it's important sometimes to articulate your point as simple as possible. So. Well, it, it, I have to go to confession a lot. Sometimes the language gets a little coarse, but it's the love that I get comes in a through. Little trouble. Yeah, it's the love that comes through. So um, obviously, okay, so it's a lot lot going on what do you um it seems like throughout you kind of your you and your husband's kind of the business cycle on this you've all been kind of maybe ahead of the curve you know is trying to adapt and change Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you kind of see the future what do you what are you kind of looking for i mean you're kind of thinking the sheep your sheep population will grow a little bit and I mean, because it just it seems like just talking this little bit you know you you, you're obviously in a bunch of different groups you know you're teaching kids Mm -hmm. if they're able to come out here you know time right and then people who are you're going to make this sort of their livelihood, um, you know, kind of two different, very, very different groups. Um, but, yeah, kind of what do, you, what do you think kind of is next for you all? I want to grow the yarn shop. Okay. That is my, my goal right now is to grow our customer base and, and grow our yarn 
mm-hmm. yarn store business. I we we teach classes. I have a young lady that works with me as my associate shop manager, and she is excellent. She is the same age as my daughters, and um, she has been, even though she, I, I call her a city girl, but she has been the best sport. I've made her come to the barn and help deliver Kriyas. Um, I've helped. She's learned how to change Pearl's diaper. She, um, <laughs> she has been such a good sport, and um, so I am a really have an outrageous sense of humor, and mm-hmm. she even has adjusted to that. And so she has so many gifts and talents as far as teaching, knitting, mm-hmm. and how to do things and how to put things together. She's really good. The customers love her. And um, so she designs and does most of the classes, the teaching here. So we teach knitting, but different things like socks, how to make socks. And we do sweaters. We just, Mm -hmm. any kind of accessory can be made from our yarns. So how many people are coming out for, in in general? Obviously the numbers change, but. The numbers change. um, Like the last two days have been really quiet, Mm -hmm. but um, you know, like tonight is Happy Knitter Night, and it's purely a social group of ladies. We've been getting together for years. Mm-hmm. There's sometimes as many as 15 or 16 of us. And that's a lot of talking and a lot of wine. And then um, or sometimes it's as few as seven. Right. But we always um, have the best time. Everybody's knitting whatever they want to knit or crocheting whatever they want to crochet. Um they always bring wine, and um, we keep that on tap on Wednesday nights. We laugh a lot. We talk a lot. We solve all the problems of the world, um, and we have the best time. It's just such a good bonding thing for us. And then on Thursday evenings, every other Thursday, we have Crochet Club. Okay. And those are the ladies that really are keyed in on crochet. And it's um, headed up by Jennifer Williams, who's head of the Crochet Guild of America. She's not head of it. Mm -hmm. She's their um, recruiter, membership recruiter. Okay. And so she comes and she is, she brings a wonderful uh, uh, personality to the mix. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we did a philanth- they did a philanthropy, the crocheters did, of making chemo hats. Okay. And so yeah. we donated chemo hats and so we did we were the th- we won third place in the whole uh, national organization for how many we made. And so our reward is a pizza party. So tomorrow night we get to have pizza to celebrate all the chemo hats we made. A fun time to be out here. I know. It'll be really fun. We have so, fun. So but you you're think- a guy, so I'm sorry. Yeah, sadly, but, that's, that's really what's prevented me from knitting all these years in crochet. Well, we it's it's you, obviously sexism. It's kept me out of that industry. Is. Um, what is huh. so you so you're looking more like that Boone County connection and and you know people are into this um, kind of growing from there. Um, so do you see the day where you're not as focused on the farm part and more on the social, or you know you're always going to have that mix and balance between the two? And the farm is what makes the shop right the 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 farm the animals the production that they provide us and we're a green farm Mm -hmm. i like to say that because of the sierra club Mm -hmm. we're a green farm we have our own water supply here um we have a deep water well that we were told could um service the city of cincinnati so we have plenty of water um is that originally what brought people this land I think it is. Okay. But the state didn't know it was there until we told them. Well. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> well, fair enough. A little, little secret. Yeah, fair enough. But um, so, um, so we're green. So every year they're going to reproduce fiber for us. Right. And so and we're going to make yarn and we're going to sell it in there. So that, uh, that out there is what this in here is about. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we're trying to educate my knitters. Um, uh, and carrying some manufactured yarns, I can tell you the alpaca yarn that's imported from South America and China, mm-hmm. I'm not allowed to say bad words on this, am I? It's, it's really bad yarn. Okay. It's, it's not, awful. It's not as superior as to what you, it's not the grade one that you are. Oh, it's, it's bad. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to create yarn snobs. 
that's fair enough. I want my my ladies that come to knit to be yarn snobs and say, "Well, I'm not going to spend my time on this." Well, and they, and they will know the difference. They will. So, so we're getting ready to have our first annual fall retreat, mm-hmm. and so again, that network connection. Um, we are our accommodations are at the new Airbnb that's owned by uh, Joyce McNeely, who runs Washington Square. Okay, yeah. So um, she's going to feed us and and, wow, and house great. us, and then we're going to meet down here and have classes, and so that's going to be a lot of fun. So you're getting more into the educational part, as in more elaborate. It's getting bigger, you know. Not uh, yeah, and know. and uh, oh, I've never gotten away from the educational right, part. Right. We used to do National Alpaca Farm Days the last week in September, and um, we haven't done that for the. We're not doing it this year, and we didn't do it last year. Um, it just got so big. We would have uh, food vendors, we would have educational uh, spots set up. We had the Cub Scouts come sell popcorn. We'd all get in a fight over the caramel corn, <laughs> um, and we just had such. A, we have bluegrass music. It was fun. But um, you're almost a victim of your own success, though, right? When that happens, oh you get too big. It One gets too year much. we had 1,200 people here, and it was crazy. Wow! I know, but we did it. <laughs> yeah, and it all worked. But I was really tired. Right. So now I think I'm kind of tired. So I think I need to not do that. Well, you're doing. It sounds like you're making that pivot to smaller groups. That's more meaningful experience, mm-hmm. instead of just kind of coming out. And which there's nothing wrong with that. But there's other places if you want to just get a taste of being outside, you know, this is a little bit different. So we do, we do want to, to be still a, a promoter of the, of the community. Right. So this, that's why I wanted to do, I agreed to do this thing with the library mm-hmm. because it's Boone County. Right. Uh, we're doing the bluegrass market this weekend mm-hmm. uh, to help promote that. Mm-hmm. We um, are also doing, uh, like I said, we're doing the retreat, which is our thing. But um, there's something else we're doing. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> there's some right. other thing yeah. we're doing. I always go to the Wool Fest and, yeah. uh, and oh, represented yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but, oh, I know what it is. Um, it's at the ag. It's the quilt show. Okay. That they do every year in September, and we're in charge of the fiber display. Okay. So I'm so excited. They've never done fiber before, but this year they're going to do a big fiber thing, and Eagle Bend is in charge of that fiber. So you keep finding. More markets for your fiber. I don't even know if market's the right word. I, I guess maybe. I mean, you're connecting with more people. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. That's so exciting. this is fun. Well, good. Good. I, well, I know that we're looking forward to getting out and taking a look at the, the acreage. And... Okay. So now I'm going to take you inside my yarn store. And this is where lots of things, fun things happen. Okay, so what we have on this table, I had this set up for the yarn crawl, but this this is a sample of the alpaca yarns that we carry. So um, this, this yarn, for example, is a ribbon blend, and there's two colors of alpaca in this. One of the alpaca's name is Joy, and she's white, and the other one's name was Anya, and she's brown. So we put this together, but just feel of it. So that's a yarn that you can make something and wear it next to your skin because okay. it's soft. But all of these yarns are special uh, to me in some way. We put a little bling in this one. Um, <laughs> that's not natural. That's not natural. No, uh, it's not. not. Back of, um, a pack of gold slider. This is Sari. Sari is a totally different fiber. It has a beautiful drape and a lovely shine. Uh, I know you don't care about any of that as a oh, man. But, oh, it's important to have a good shine. But you need to tell your wife. This is from my Shetland sheep, so I'm kind of proud because it's soft for a Shetland. Okay. So, so they're typically more coarse. Mm-hmm. Okay. But my mine are. Oh, mine are soft. It must be the water. I think it is. So anyway, so that's some of the alp, uh, alpaca and sheep yarns. And then we always have to have um, the best-selling thing ever in the whole wide world are alpaca socks. Okay. Alpaca socks. I have more boyfriends that come to see me every year to get alpaca socks. Not only are they warm, they wick the moisture away from your feet. So you think, okay, warm feet, that means they're going to sweat, they're going to stink, right? No. With alpaca, it wicks the moisture away from your feet, so your feet stay dry, but they're still good and warm. These are 
these are the best ever, the extremes. And my um, alpaca fiber is are it's in these. Oh, okay. And um, so it's not in all of them, but it okay. is in these. And then um, the best part is, and I don't like to tell this to many people, so they won't get the wrong impression, but you can wear these four or five days in a row without washing them, and your feet they don't sting. Because um, it's because it just pushes away. It's just not sticking the, around. Just the the fiber. So. So I always take them off and stick my hand down in them and wash them under the sink with a bar of soap and let them dry and put them back on. <laughs> so, but they get they can be worn a lot and people love these and they they last a long time. Um, so and there's different types, you know, like we got these in for the the hunters and the firefighters and. But these are the ones that are made from your. Yes. Okay. The extremes. Okay. And then, um, but. There's a variety, and a variety of prices. We also have insoles made that you can, this is from my alpaca as well, and you stick these in your shoe yeah. underneath and um, the insole that's in there, and then cut it to fit perfectly in your shoe. And these are very insulated too. So okay. my husband wears these in his muck boots.